Hello, welcome. Thank you all for coming and joining us at this open online briefing. We call it Series 5, Episode 9. And what's important about these events is that we come together, we know each other and we explore together and it's great. I'd like to start by inviting uh, our colleague Catherine Deland to just set us off. So Catherine, welcome and thank you for being here today. Hi everybody, happy Friday. It's lovely to see you all. Um, gosh, it's great. We already have 38 people here um, and it's, it's, a, it's a cold evening here. I hope it is cold or warm where you are, but that you are in a happy and healthy place. Um, I want to say first, as we always do, a big shout out to Live Illustration. Thanks so much, Chris. Shipton is here with us. Super great. Really looking forward to checking in with you both at the midpoint and at the end of the briefing. And also to Global Goals Cast. Thanks, Edie, Mike, and Simon. Lovely to see you here. Um, really looking forward to the last, last week's, the last, not last week's, two weeks ago's podcast. Super powerful. We all really loved it. Thanks so much. We'll really be looking forward to the next one. Insofar as this is being recorded for a podcast, I want to make sure all of you know that if you have something to say that you do not want reflected on that podcast, just send me a, a message. You can do it in the chat. You can send it over email. You can send it over my phone. I'll make sure that it's in the chat so you have it. And we'll make sure that that doesn't show up. Otherwise, I think it is time for us to hand back to David. We're all keen to hear your thoughts. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay, there are a lot of people um, who I would love to greet personally who've joined us today. Uh, some I can see more than one behind the camera. In some cases, it's people who haven't been here for a bit. Um, some who we've been working with on the food project, some who've been we've been partnering with, particularly in some of the more recent work we've been doing on on COVID prevention. So, to everybody, hello. And then I would like towards the end, if I can, to greet some of you individually. Now, we are all going to also while we're talking make a list of people who'd like to intervene. I promised I will not go on too long today and want to have a conversation. I'm very pleased that uh, uh, Edie Lush and Mike Goreskes are here uh, because I want to give a very special thank you to Global Goalscast for producing podcasts of a very, very high standard that I'm told by people who've clicked on them that they found helpful. Those of you who featured in the last podcast and who've seen it since, don't hesitate when we have the discussion. If you want to tell us how you felt about that, uh, um, it was an emotional session uh, two weeks ago. I think all of us, having just heard about Omicron and seeing some slightly uh, unfortunate behaviour by a number of governments, uh, were not feeling happy about it and we expressed our views. Um, and I'm very pleased about that, but obviously we are making some of our own, own intimate feelings accessible to others. And let us know if that makes you feel uncomfortable. Um, I think we need that kind of openness in this group as we move forward. Just for myself, it's been a tricky last two weeks, honestly. Um, you see, I, I think that we have known for a long time just how difficult this virus is to deal with. It really is hard and we're learning all the time what it's like to try to operate with a coronavirus pandemic advancing quite ferociously across the world. And it's because it's a constant learning experience. It's also constantly uh, emotionally perturbing in lots of ways, and particularly when it comes to my own life what it means for my think thoughts about my mortality and also my anxieties about seeing members of my family uh, in particularly in the coming coming weeks so i'm very happy to explore all that uh, with any of you if you want to um, i think uh, that it that is relevant especially if anybody else is feeling quite frazzled by what all is what, what's going on and what it means 
for all of all of us as as people. Now we've got folk joining from all over the world, and as we talk, uh, I want to be sure that you express perspectives either from where you are or from communities that you're working closely with. I'm going to stick struck with the structure that we've used in several of the recent briefings and I want therefore to start by actually talking about the pandemic and in order to do that uh, I want to uh, spend a bit of time actually thinking about uh, what the pandemic is doing around the world. I am trying to organise to show uh, 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 um, a, a slide with some of the graphics on it and if you just take two seconds I just want to call that up and uh, it's coming now uh, once I've found a way to get the, the slide up um, I can then discuss All right here we have the latest slide showing the global epidemiological situation as produced by WHO. Catherine, you'll tell me if it, for any reason it doesn't show. And what you should see in this picture is where I'm moving my cursor around is on the, the, um, the graph that shows numbers of reported cases per day over the period between early last year and now. Just so that you know, in the last 24 hours before this situation report, which appeared on the 9th of December, there were 644,000 new cases uh, in 24 hours. That is a lot. It's a lot of coronavirus being picked up. And so it's not surprising that we are in the middle of another of these spikes of COVID uh, reported from around the world that's been building up since October. And most of the reported cases that have been bulging out the numbers are coming from Europe. That's the green part of the curve. And, um, and uh, it's quite disturbing. Uh, we had hoped that the numbers of deaths would not climb up parallel with the numbers of cases, and certainly the numbers of deaths is, is not as big as the daily death rates were due to COVID in August and September or in April and May. But there are still a lot of people dying. 8,213 persons were reported as dying with covid um, in the 24-hour period, bringing us to a, a total of global recorded deaths of the order of 5,277,000. Where is all this COVID happening? Well, uh, if we look at the countries with the highest numbers of new cases in the last 24 hours, United States of America is top of the list, followed by Germany, which has had a big recent uptick in numbers of cases, as has France, big increase in cases in the last few days. United Kingdom has stayed high pretty well consistently for, for a, a number of weeks. Russian Federation is high, Poland has climbed suddenly, Turkey is high, but South Africa has come in to the top 10 and we'll go back to South Africa in a minute. Uh, Netherlands, those of you from Netherlands don't need reminding that you've got a pretty big um, upsurge in cases and the numbers are going up in Italy as well. Now, I think it's just important to be stressing to everybody that this big upsurge in case numbers in Europe is associated with the Delta variant of the virus. Uh, the new variant that was talked about two weeks ago and that's really got into the news a lot recently, which I am going to talk about, Omicron, is 
not making much difference to the numbers in most of the world, but the recent uptick in numbers of people with COVID in South Africa is thought to be pretty much to do with this new variant, Omicron. I'd just like to talk a little bit about what I'm seeing around the world as I look at these numbers. First of all, remember that COVID builds up in spikes and then surges in quite narrow geographical areas. And nobody quite knows what leads to an upsurge in a particular country and why we've got the current periodicity of upsurges happening every three to four months. Remember that a, a total figure conceals a lot of different surges that are in different locations and in trying to understand what the virus is doing it's really helpful to dissect down and look at a particular quite tight geographical area. For example, uh, looking at the information that we can pick up from Swiss uh, statistics and French statistics, the part of Switzerland, France, where I'm currently living, which is the border between France and Switzerland in the Department of AINA uh, in France, and also the part of Switzerland that is Canton of Geneva and Canton of Vaud. If you look at the maps, we are in an area of really quite high prevalence, uh, sorry, it's quite high incidence with the numbers of cases being reported as several hundred, a hundred thousand per week. This is a, a hotspot area and um, not surprising authorities in this area are really quite worried. Now, when we talk about COVID and what's happening, we tend to say that people are the solution. Virus is the problem and people is the solution. So we tend to say that it's really important to invest in people, offering them consistent information, being as honest as we can with them. Don't be overly optimistic or pe pe pessimistic. Be straight with the people and try to do everything possible not to imply that the way in which people should respond to, their, to, the, to the coronavirus uh, it should in any way reflect their political beliefs. The virus is not a political animal. And those of us who are involved in dealing with it should be dealing with it without having an ideological tinge to our responses. I appreciate this is all wishful thinking. One of the reasons why there's so much controversy about what to do about COVID is because there are uncertainties and that one of the ways in which societies handle their uncertainties is through a political ideology and so there is a community of people who very strongly believe that covid is being exaggerated for various reasons and that actually a lot of the precautions that have been proposed that people can actually adopt uh, are inappropriate and so there is a view that says it's an exaggeration uh, there are others who say that actually it's much worse than is generally being perceived, and that governments ought to be taking a much stronger line. We say people are the solution, and partnering between people and government is key. We want to try to avoid constant hesitancy and non-uptake on activities that people can do to reduce transmission. So. The style that I'm increasingly ad advocating is a very well-developed partnership between political leaders and people. Of course, built into that is the absolute need for good examples to be set. It's not appropriate if you're asking people to wear masks and not to breathe in each other's air if you have well-attended parties where nobody wears masks and there's a lot of overt socialization. So example really matters in the people uh, leader partnerships that we're proposing. But most importantly, trying very hard not to get into a situation where the relationship is adversarial. And that's why taking my lead from Tedros of WHO, from 
Dr. Hans Kluger, the regional director for WHO for the European region, and others, I've been very clear that as far as I'm concerned, legal mandates for people to do things, whether it's wearing masks or to be vaccinated, really must be a last resort. And we'll talk a bit about vaccine mandates today because it's a very big issue, particularly in the US. And my own constant wish is see this as a last resort. If you compel people to be vaccinated and they don't want to be vaccinated, you will find it very hard to get them to be part of your response. I'm also wanting to stress about public health. It's something that I feel has not got sufficient attention in COVID responses, and many of you have worked with me over the years to try to get more understanding of what public health is all about. Uh, I did a session this week with the European Public Health Association and the Association of Schools of Public Health, ASPHER, was represented. Uh, I'm thinking that anybody who is working in public health just ought to think very hard about how to get people to better understand, get the public to better understand what public health is all about. It's not hospitals. It's the services that we have in communities that enable people to understand their risks and help to reduce those risks. And that means having a good coverage of the population with public health experts who are, have got sufficient understanding and authority to be able to bring together groups of actors at local level to respond to public health threats. So perhaps I should give three points that I think are relevant to anybody who is approaching the the, the pandemic with a public health lens. First of all, this virus is not going away. The virus that causes COVID-19 is most definitely here to stay. Uh, it's volatile, it tends to come and rise up and it tends to settle down, but it's not, not showing any signs of saying goodbye to us. I think that the virus itself is constantly showing its capabilities for mutation and its ability to form variants. And Omicron, the latest variant, is, I believe, not the first of the multi-mutation variants that we're going to see, the kind of variants that do look as though they've got the capacity to actually penetrate the defences that have been introduced by vaccines to a much greater degree than some of the original virus strains. Of course, the public health people who are working on this just do not have a sufficient knowledge about Omicron to know how it will impact on the patterns of COVID right now. Will it have an advantage over, for example, the Delta strain by being more transmissible between people? Will it have uh, an advantage over the Delta strain by being able to bait through the protection that is offered by uh, vaccination? Uh, will it have a different illness profile compared with Delta and other variants? Well, there are early reports suggesting that it really is more transmissible. John Atkinson, who I think is with us today on his iPhone, was telling me that what he was looking at showed him a doubling time of numbers of people infected with the Omicron variant is between two and three days. And that's very similar to the doubling time we saw at the very, very beginning uh, of COVID-19. And um, it's quite serious if we've got that doubling time being reported uh, in different parts of the world where people are already taking action to try to reduce transmission. That does suggest that this is more transmissible, that it'll have a higher R0, the number of people who are infected by one person with the disease, and so that will give it a real advantage. So I'm um, reading a number of projections by experts who are telling me just how Omicron is, is um, uh, going to become the dominant strain. But let's wait and see. Let's not make any assumptions right now. I want to spend a little bit more about Omicron and its ability perhaps to break through the defences offered by uh, the different vaccines. Here's the general position about 
how these vaccines are working. They are stimulating both antibodies and what are called T cells, the kind of uh, cells that are produced by the body in response to a threat that can surround that, uh, that threat and make it easier for the body's defenses to digest it and get rid of it. So the T cells are super important, but the antibodies are also important. These are compounds in the blood that bind to a pathogen and, and actually also make it easier for it to be dealt with by the body's defense mechanisms. So what happens when one is in, injected with, for example, one of the mRNA vaccines uh, or by AstraZeneca? Answer, after a period of weeks, usually two or three, the body develops the capacity to produce antibodies in response to the virus. That's because the vaccine is priming the body's immune response, getting it sort of tuned up and ready so that once the nasty virus comes along, that uh, virus can be dealt with, the illness will not be so severe, a person will be much, much less likely to die. Well, the mRNA vaccines and AstraZeneca produce really good antibodies and T cell potentiation to deal with the normal strains of COVID. But the early signs are that, that they will be less good, the antibodies and the T cells, are defending against Omicron. Now, as if I have been given the vaccine, my antibody response will not say strong month after month. This is not immunity for life. It looks like the immune response really does um, wear down and become less pronounced some months after you've been immunized. Is it one year, 12 months? Is it six months? Does it depend on your age? Does it depend on your nutritional status? All these things are likely to be important. It looks like the immunity you get and the duration of immunity after immunization is much less good if you're in my kind of age group in the 70s than if you're in your 30s. Uh, it does look as though the immunity wanes in the area of six months and certainly is a lot reduced after a year, which is why booster immunizations are being encouraged to help people top up their immune response capacity. So there does look as though uh, we've got this declining immunity anyway. So what you can imagine will happen is that if somebody who's been immunized, say, 12 months ago is challenged by being exposed to the Delta variant, then there's a pretty good chance that they will have a strong response. If the hypothesis is that if somebody is challenged by being exposed to Omicron, that they will have a, a really a, a much feebler response at 12 months than they might have done a few months earlier, i.e that as protection wanes in the months after immunization, so those who have been immunized will be more susceptible to be infected by Omicron than they will by Delta. If that's clear to you, you will also follow me if I then say to you that there will be a lot of variation in individual responses to a virus like Omicron, and that variation will depend on the person's age, the person's nutrition, the person's general health, uh, the functioning of the person's immune system. But the general view is as protection wanes in the months after immunization, the waning will be quicker if you're challenged by Omicron than if you're challenged by Delta. So that's why the argument is being put out very strongly that to protect against Omicron, those who are eligible for boosters should have their boosters on time. There is absolutely no case for overrunning and, and postponing your boosters. I'm very clear to all of you that I personally do not believe that a population vaccinated with any one of the current vaccines is also going to be a population in which transmission of the virus just stops. I don't think that's true. And I think there's growing evidence that 
even if you're vaccinated and are not getting severe illness, you're still capable of transmitting the virus and infecting other people. And so I'm asking everybody to bear this in mind. Vaccination does not stop transmission. It does stop, or sorry, does reduce the risk of severe illness and death. So what does that mean? It means that any country or community that relies on vaccination alone to try to reduce transmission is taking a huge gamble. As well as vaccination, we believe, and I'm quoting here WHO colleagues, we believe that efforts to reduce transmission are absolutely key. Just reduce the number of contacts you have with other people. And if you are in contact with other people, avoid them breathing your exhaled air and avoid your breathing their exhaled air. If you're carrying the virus and you don't know about it, uh, the best way to stop your exhaled air leading to infection of somebody near you is to wear a well-fitting surgical face mask. Peter Hebert, who's on this call, is very clear. It should be a three-ply face mask. It should be properly pushed across the bridge of your nose and you should put it on and wear it properly and not have it half on. And if it gets wet or if there's a hole in it, you get rid of it. You get rid of it properly and you put on a new one. There is no excuse for not wearing face masks. I know that's a double negative, but I mean it. There is no excuse for not wearing face masks. If people are truly panicked by wearing face masks, let's understand it and let's work with them on alternatives. But just simply wearing, not wearing a face mask because you don't like it, because it doesn't make your mouth taste nice or that sort of stuff, it's not good enough. Secondly, if you're going to avoid inhaling other people's exhaled air, please maintain physical distancing. It's the easiest way to do it. Just holding your breath till you walk past people, it's a bit risky. But all the time, you're trying to avoid inhaling what they exhale. But that means, therefore, thirdly, that you're going to be careful in confined spaces. Pay attention to ventilation. Pay attention to ventilation by having windows open. Pay attention to mechanical ventilation and consult your engineering colleagues. They know what to do to improve ventilation. So it really does get the air circulating so that the risk of inhaling other people's exhaled air is reduced. Practice good hygiene. Remember that cough etiquette and dealing with coughs particularly or as similar issues of trying to stop spluttering over other people and to keep surfaces cleaned is really important. It's part of the response. And if you're vaccinating, you're using the vaccine as a shield to protect people who are at risk. So infection control really matters. And I want to reinstate very strongly the notion in people's minds that when you've got somebody who's positive, you want to make sure that they are isolated and you want to find their contacts and isolate them case detection isolation contact tracing is vital again talking to who this morning they were saying to us don't forget the testing countries that have started introducing charges for testing perhaps as a way to try to persuade people to get vaccinated it's very unwise you may end up not testing enough people your numbers start start not giving a true indication of the incidence rates and you may well also end up with very high test positivity rates which is a sign that there is trouble. So we don't know enough about Omicron but what we do know is that the way in which you deal with Omicron is the same as the way in which you deal with Delta. And so that brings me to my final last point. It is absolutely essential that there is a, a global response to this pandemic with new variants emerging, with the real inequity around access to vaccination and with all the toing and froing on travel and the inequities on some of the travel restrictions that have been introduced. It's got to be a, a, a constant approach to this with protocols appearing that are agreed across nations for travel and also for dealing with new variants as they emerge. We're not there. 
We've got a lot of countries looking at the possibility of a global response to the next pandemic, but dealing with this pandemic is still just about each country for themselves. So what we're going to do in 2022 is to continue to push very strongly for a global response. The WHO special envoys will give this highest possible priority and we will just not stop talking about it and we will look for advocates to help us. Gordon Brown in particular has been really, really helpful. Also the head of the African Union and plus also the head of the African Union Development Agency, Ibrahim Maki, head of the African CDC, John and Kengasong. These are all people who are just saying, unless we do this together, this virus is going to beat us. And as Maria Van Kokovi of WHO said to C Catherine and I this morning again, she just said, the virus is winning. And I think that is the point we need to keep saying to people. The virus is winning, and it's winning because we've not presented a united front against it, and that can only be possible if world leaders work properly together to get that united front in place. If any of you is from a business, please talk to your CEO and say to your CEO that it's your CEO's responsibility to talk to prime ministers or presidents of the countries in which your company operates. Because unless there is a stable, global, standard response to this pandemic, which is going to go on for the coming years, your own ability to run any kind of international trading, international activity is going to be sorely damaged and the problems we've already got with supply chains are just going to get worse and worse. So please tell your bosses to start working on the political leaders because we need the politicians to listen to the people they are likely to listen to, which include CEOs of major companies. Thank you very much for the chance to speak. Now we'll go back to Catherine for uh, the mid-period. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Chris, I wonder if we could pull up your drawing. Oh, I, I keep saying drawing, illustration. I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah. Do, do you want to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, I think you need to spotlight it. Oh, there we go. Nope, here we go. Looks great. Uh, I guess what? I actually have COVID right now, and I'm on day eight of isolation. And, oh my gosh, uh, Chris, yeah. are you okay? Well, I, I to be honest, it's pretty awful. I've got to say, this is like the first bit of work I've done. Um, so the drawing's a bit ropey, but I thought it would be rather weird to do one of these whilst actually having it. I always thought it might be a possibility. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. The experience is is uh, not great, and I'm like double vaccinated and everything. Um, one thing I've actually, one thing I did wonder actually is, you know, is it Omicron? That's the thing. Because, you know, when you get it, you have this amazing sense of like paranoia and intrepidation when you see those two lines and the lateral flow. And then um, sort of an out of body experience, which is partially being ill, but also being trapped in a house for like 10 days. And it's not a very big house. And, but I tell you what, I didn't lose my sense of taste mm. and it was like mainly achy and weird feeling and it didn't seem to have any of the regular uh issues and i am double vaxxed as well so you'd have thought it would be a bit more resistant mm. but anyway the good news is uh, i'm sort of out the other side of it and the kids are totally unaffected mm. uh my wife's like well we both had similar uh horribleness but um and the only other thing like i thought i might as well ask the expert is i'm slightly worried Right, so I'm allowed out on Monday. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, can I still give it to people on Monday, even though I've been in the house for 10 days and going through this weird experience? But anyway, um, just as everything was getting incredibly complacent with events and masks off and who cares, everything has just flipped back to the same sort of feelings it was last year. Events have been cancelled. Christmas parties cancelled, everything has been cancelled, all of my real life jobs cancelled, luckily we do virtual things, but anyway, um, just thought I'd Chris, ask, the yes, ask the expert basically. Chris, we'll talk about this uh, later, but uh, they, um, I don't want to do, I 
do not like actually giving uh, medical advice myself uh, because sorry. I don't practice. <laughs> don't say sorry. I just don't practice clinical medicine. But there are people here who do, and uh, I'm sure that um, they will um, respond. But I'm very happy to have a, a quick call with you afterwards, and uh, we will try and make sure that that happens. Thank you so much for being here. Very interesting that you say you've not lost your sense of smell and taste. Uh, just to tell colleagues that uh, some of the people who've been looking at patients who've got Omicron are saying, surprisingly, they don't seem to have that telltale COVID symptom. So who knows, Chris, who knows? Um, uh, now, um, so, um, gosh, I want, to, I want to spend a bit longer and give you a hug, but I can't do that. And it would be anyway not a cool thing to do. And it's jolly hard to hug over Zoom, but I've tried. So um, we will um, uh, talk again and try to talk before the weekend gets too far advanced, Chris. Thank you again. Uh, I want to hear from people. I want to hear from as many people as possible. I'd like to hear wherever you are. Um, we've got... Um, please, yeah. by all means, talk about what's happening in your own experience. Governments on. Talk about the world. Um, and I need this because I've got a lot of, of um, interview moments coming up and... As I think you know, I find these these sessions are really, really good at helping me to just connect with and, and get my feet on the ground uh, and, and listen to what's really happening. Um, I think uh, just looking, uh, James Ritchie is on, and I wanted to hear from James Ritchie a little bit about his experiences of working with employers uh, when workers are trying to navigate better working conditions under health and safety arrangements in factories or similar in hotels and the like and also there's been a particular issue about the relationship between factories needing more workers and at the same time factories saying we really want you to be vaccinated if you come and work for us and in fact if you're not vaccinated we won't be able to give you a job. And so on the one hand, the factories are saying, we need more people. On the other hand, they sometimes just can't get the people they need because of a really strong hesitancy, particularly among low paid people around getting vaccinated. And I don't know, James, I just saw oh. you. There you are, James. Do you feel like talking? If so, unmute and just let rip a bit on your experiences with trying to help people get themselves protected, but also uh, companies do the right thing on how they treat people uh, with regard to COVID threats. James, please, if you like. Uh, thank, thanks very much, David. And um, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, send my best wishes to, to Chris. I mean, it's really a terrible situation you're in, Chris, and, and I hope things uh, continue to improve for you. And um, thank you, David, again, for your remarks today for your address today you are so consistent but you always say it in a way which is new and refreshing and it's helpful for all of us in our different leadership positions to to be able to exchange these views on a regular basis if i could just uh, touch on some of the workplace issues at the moment we, we are seeing a move by some employers towards mandatory vaccination uh, and I understand it is a last resort, but it is a resort that we as trade unions also understand. Um, and why? And, and it's because this, this really, the, the international standard for occupational safety and health is ILO Convention 155, which says many things. But one important thing that it says is that it is the employer's responsibility to ensure a safe workplace and to remove any hazards from the workplace, eliminate hazards from the workplace or manage the hazards as best as possible. So there is a very strong argument to say that if an employer allows people who are more likely to transmit COVID by being unvaccinated, 
in the workplace, then they are failing to remove the hazard in a way that is within their power to do. Hence, I insist that employees of this enterprise be vaccinated. Now, it, it's a last resort, it's difficult, but what our um, trade union affiliates for our international organization try and do is work and negotiate with employers around how they manage the workplace. And if they agree that uh, uh, mandatory vaccination or as, or as maximum as possible vaccination uh, is desirable, and they do, then it's a matter of implementing a program which encourages workers very strongly to get vaccinated and dismissal from the employment is the absolute last resort, but it happens sometimes. And if I can just give the example of um, Tyson Foods in the United States, a very, very big employer, uh, our affiliate, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, represents 39,000 workers that work for this employer. Of those, they introduced mandatory vaccination. They negotiated the terms of that mandatory vaccination with the union. And of uh, 39,000 workers, there is uh, 119, I think the figure is at least, it's certainly less than 200 workers who ended up being dismissed because they refused vaccination. Now, the other thing that we're finding in, in the workplace is that some workers will say, if you force me to get vaccinated, I will leave and find another job. Now, even employers who do not require mandatory vaccination will often say to a job applicant, are you vaccinated? And if the answer is no, then the employer is likely to find another employee or another prospective employee, even in a tight labour market, which we're facing now increasingly in, um, in North America and Western Europe. So David, they're just a comment, a couple of comments about some of the issues that we're working on at the moment. We also know that in places like hotels, safe workers mean safe guests, safe guests mean safe workers, and the interface between public health and is absolutely critical and one in which we're encouraging uh, uh, leaders to understand and people in the industry to understand. Thank you. Uh, having had the chance of, of talking with and working with James Ritchie and his colleagues actually quite a lot over the last two years, I'm more and more aware of the absolute importance of trades unions in helping to establish the best possible, in terms of health and safety, uh, working environments for personnel. And it's super interesting, James, just to feel, as you talk about it, to feel the spirit of working together that has happened in quite a lot of factories. And, and what's great is that those success stories are showing some of the rest the right way to do this. There's a, definitely a wrong way, but there seems to be a right way as well. James, if people want to know more about this, can they contact you directly or is there a sort of general uh, place at the uh, at the uh, IUF that uh, uh, sort of generic hotline, uh, generic email address? How do they get more info? David, I'll just put in the chat my email address and I'm very happy if people uh, wish to contact me directly. Thank you. Now, we have some occupational physicians on this uh, Zoom today. I would very much like to stay in the theme of COVID and the workplace and ne negotiating spaces and the extent to which individuals have the capacity to do this. Claire's unmuted. Thank you. I was coming to you. This is Dr. Claire Rayner. Um, I also would love it, Claire, if you, if you want to, if you could talk a bit about long COVID sure. and uh, with this very, very high uh, instance rate in the UK, particularly among children, is there any information appearing about long COVID amongst some of these kids who uh, even, uh, I mean, around here, we've got a school that's just sent 2,000 people home recently uh, because it's got a, 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 a biggish uh, Delta and Omicron outbreak going on. You just think all the time about how much long COVID is brewing up there as well. Over to you. 
Sure, I'll, I'll um, mention about the occupational aspects of things. Um, it's also my belief um, that it's extremely important to work through the unions with the messages, the sorts of messages you've been given. So last week, um, some of my um, advocacy colleagues and I spoke to two unions. Um, well, one was the Trades Union Council in the UK here, which has an overview of everybody. One was the Civil Service Union and the other one was a teachers union. So I actually really do believe that this is one of the ways to go because they are keen to promote the same messages, but they really are a little bit disempowered to do so. So I think those messages need strengthening through them. Um, I'm very concerned about particularly healthcare workers and teachers and their occupational exposure. Um, I think we're still highly exposed. I was talking to some medical colleagues last night and I said, look, someone said not very many surgeons have got infected. And I said, well, that's because their exposures are entirely different. And you have to look at what's different about what they do compared to others. And, you know, anybody who's talking to somebody or in close proximity procedures in the upper airway, you know, they need proper protection. I am seriously concerned by the total lack of appropriate protection for this virus. Today, um, some 60, 58 doctors here have sites who are very, very ill with, with COVID. Many have gone from being very fit and in, into wheelchairs. I very bravely, um, with the support of lawyers, sent a letter to the Prime Minister. It's, it, I will um, email it to you after this. That's going to be all over the media tonight. Um, and they are calling for an inquiry um, and proper workplace provision. And I agree with everything that James Ritchie has said. It's about, it's the legal aspect. Vaccine mandates, such a difficult thing. I, I'm trying to work through my ideas on that. I think it's very, I think for people's own protection and for the protection of colleagues and other people, if they're frontline, they should have protection. I think everybody's got a sort of civic duty to keep levels down, but at the same time, there are side effects and some problems for some people with the vaccine. So I think it would have to be carefully individualized. Um, children, just briefly, it's extremely upsetting. There's no mitigations or protections in schools. Um, and uh, they are getting long COVID. There seems to be very little difference to the long-term effects on children than adults. They're exactly the same, really is, and it's heartbreaking to see. Thank, thank you, Claire. I must say, I was waiting for today and hoping you were on because I've been asking around people uh, who I normally am in contact with about long COVID and children, just trying to get that kind of sense, and I hadn't got it, and so, uh, what I tend to do is, is you have been given me your sensation. Yeah. I will triangulate that very carefully. I want really? to understand, is it the same in different parts of the world or is it more pronounced in, for example, temperate climates like the UK compared with um, some of the more uh, warmer parts of the world? Back to you, Claire. Impossible to say, actually, because there's so much the experience of children and, and the poor parents is being so denied and minimised by by everybody that runs health services in, in this country, really. They're having more of a battle than, than adults are. And, and it's the reinfections some of these children are getting. Some of these children have been, I know, they've been off for 20 months unable to go to school. Yeah. Now, this isn't a... You know, and they're getting reinfections on top. I dread yeah. to think because I think what we're going to find is brain damage with some of them, just like yeah. in adults. Yeah. Uh, so, um, N.K. Seti, thank you, Claire. I'm not being rude to anybody. No, I'm no. just trying to go chunk, 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 because we've only got 11 minutes. N.K. Seti wants to talk about reinfections. N.K., would you like, I know you want to ask questions. Would you like to just tell us what's on your mind? And then I'd like to go to Ndir uh, uh if I can, if you're hearing me. Um, and Yindirama Yakubu, if you would like to come in. But first of all, NK. Thank you, David. Uh, I hope uh, you are able to hear the internet connection is a little faulty. Mm -hmm. 
what I would like to say is what you said in the beginning. I'll take one or two minutes only mm-hmm. to say that public health is an art and science. Hmm. Epidemiology and statistics are just the tools to apply. Hmm. And what we have been concentrating up till now is more of a technocentric approach. Hmm. We need to focus on community centric approach also to yield some results. Hmm. And what I observe currently, there are knee jerk reactions which are happening, especially after the Omicron was uh, detected. Now, in relation to travel restrictions, on one hand, travel restrictions are being made. I do not know how useful would they be. Hmm. At the same time, when they arrive, they are being asked to get tested. And they are not asked to leave the airport till the time they are found negative. Hmm. But in that process, what's happening is too much of a crowding which is happening yeah. at the place, which is itself defying the purpose of testing. Yeah. So I, I do not know what's really going on. Yeah. And really, certain guidelines or something which needs to be evolved, which could be, I'm not saying enforced, but yeah. which could act as a guide for different countries. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't see that happening. And I really feel the pain that public health has not become a movement. That's what I feel, even after so much of a suffering. And you just put your finger right on the issue that we have these situations emerging where there's often intense crowding and high infection risk. And these are often situations that are health situations, so-called. We ought to, we ought to be just clearer on protocols. And thank you for saying that, NK. Um, and it's the kind of thing that I can take action on. So I will, I will take this very much uh, into my uh, thinking cap and I will feed back to you. But thank you for that, NK. Uh, that, that's just re- yeah, and, and real appreciation to Dr. NK Senti joining us from New Delhi. It's very late, and uh, but also for constantly keeping me updated on, on what's going on. And dear moi, Yakubu Malafa, has been joining us on and off. I don't know where you are right now physically, but I'd love to hear your take on what's going on and any reflections you'd like to share. Let's see whether your internet works. Okay, thank you so much, um, Mr. David. It's my pleasure to be back on board again. Um, So I got an admission uh, to go back to Presently, I'm in Nigeria, but in a new part in Nigeria, that's in the northern part of Nigeria. So I would like to talk about our relaxed measures concerning the COVID-19 issues and uh, other viruses that are coming up. So uh, from where I was, initially I was in Lagos, and I know that uh, the government down there are trying their best to see that the issues of COVID-19 is being tackled um, appropriately, wearing of masks, giving distance in between and all that, and then avoiding much crowds. But coming down to the Northern part of Nigeria, it's entirely a different thing. You hardly see people wearing nose masks. And I think it's not proper for um, uh, such kind of thing to be going on. So I think uh, measures should be uh, carried out or um, we need to go back to the drawing board. I think these issues that are coming up uh, fresh presently is due to our negligence. We need to, as uh, people, we need to take measures, go back um, sensitizing people about the need to take care of themselves wear no smarts at all time and all that. So uh, that's what I have to say for now. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going sorry. To... Yeah, come on. Yeah. I need to talk about uh, empathy too. 
So uh, globally, people are facing almost the same thing. Uh, the pandemic, it's a global issue. So um, if it's possible for the appropriate bodies that are taking um, measures in sanctioning some countries from moving from one place to the other, in as much that uh, it's needed, I think empathy should be also considered to be considered while doing these things it shouldn't be just uh, maybe others to me from my from my viewpoint i see sometimes some sanctionings are not appropriate appropriately carried out so um maybe em empathy should be uh, reconsidered thank, thank you thank you thank you very much indeed for sharing that last point about if you're going to do sanctions please apply them with empathy there is nothing to be gained by applying them with, um, I suppose, brutality and uh, uh, lack of caring. So very important. Um, we will take your words and the, the way you express them with us. If Jane Badham, I, 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 I'm giving you warning, Jane. If Jane Badham is ready to give us perhaps an update on two weeks ago, of course, you would have the floor straight away. But before I go to Jane, uh, I'm trying to um, also bring in um, others who um, have got, I think, something to contribute. And I'd like to ask Peter Hebert, mm -hmm. just for, uh, as, as uh, one of the engineers who's at the heart of the new engineering response, is there anything you would like to say to me uh, in a minute or so that you'd like me to emphasize, particularly as we are trying to find better ways to deal with contagion during the cold months. Peter. I just want to pick up on a few points that have been made, which, uh, first of all, you're absolutely absolutely right. Uh, it takes time, as you told me, to get infected, and you need to be near that person that's been infected for some time. So actually, keeping moving is not a bad idea. And once you're wearing a really good mask, <clears throat> and I've put some figures on there, uh, there is a link to some information which responds to the latest knee-jerk reaction and gives the government some different approaches. But actually, um, I would also say that where you have this problem of, of mandatory vaccination, do resort to saying another option, which is to get them to wear a, a very good mask as an option to being fired in the first place, at least to give them some grace while they think about it or perhaps get over some problems. That, those are the two things I really wanted to say, but do look for the link um, and uh, there's much more information because I do believe there's some pragmatic solutions there. Hope that helps. You are so generous, Peter. And uh, Peter, pre keep your email being available to people because I know that you really are helpful on uh, both mask solutions and ventilation solutions. And you and your colleagues are one of the few groups that really have gone into this in detail. I see Michelle Effendi is with us. And um, uh, Michelle, we've only got about one minute left. So it's, but one of the things that I know you've been doing is working with uh, community-based organisations and helping them to set up networks in the communities. And I just wondered how that work is going. So Michelle, if you if you do want to speak, now would be a time when you just a couple of minutes, bring us up to speed on what's going on. Over to you. Well, well thank you so much, David. It's such a pleasure to, to hear you again. And um, I have a surprise. I have a, a new baby. I, I did not let you know that. Congratulations. But yeah, thank you. Um, so that's why I've been um, MIA, but um, I've, I have that delightful news. He's with me now, so I'm sorry if he if he speaks if he speaks as well. Um, mm. But yeah, things are um, unfortunately very very tense here in the United States. You did you did touch upon that. Um, it's it's no secret that we're that we're dealing with um, 
some um, some policies here in here in the United States with the vaccination mandates. So it's been very hard to be a community leader. And um, many of us, I do have a, a few others on the call as well. We're so thankful for you holding these online briefings um, to be able to try and um, hear directly from you so that we can um, be community centric as, as you're as you're as you're trying to um, to aim for. So we just want to continue to do that, empower people so that we can best lead ourselves. Brilliant. Nice to hear you, boy. Are you in Thank New you. England? Are you where are you? Are you in New England at the moment? Boston. I'm in the Boston, Boston area, Boston Very area. Good. Very yes. good. Well, okay. greetings to so everybody. Much. And Thank lovely you. congratulations to you and your family. Thank you. And and I and I just like Chris, I happen to have COVID right now as well. I do. It's the first time for me and I have very mild symptoms. Um, but um so we're we're getting through it. So there are many, many people who are with us today who we would love to hear from. And remember, we are a family, we've become stronger over the really many, many sessions that we've had together and we will stick together. Um, stay connected with us through whatever means you want to. We will take a break. Um, we um, stop uh, Forestie's working for two weeks between the uh, 20th and uh, of, of December and the 2nd or 3rd of January. But we will reconnect in the new year and we will try to have a similar system every two weeks we will try to keep the structure the same we feel that this structure and its rig and its um, rhythm may be helpful to you but obviously we want every one of you who feels that you've got something to say and who needs to say it to have a moment to do so and we could shorten the period when i give my updates and have more space for others who want to speak if you want to I'd like to once again thank you all. I'm going to go back to Catherine to close us uh, with any specific messages. Uh, my sister Annie Appleyard is on. I've just seen you, Annie. Thank you for lighting up your video. And so uh, then we'll say goodbye to everybody after we've heard from Catherine. Catherine, please. Oh, I think my specific messages are congratulations on the new baby. Congratulations that to Jane, it sounds like your aunt is recovering. That's fantastic. It was lovely to see all of you. We're heading towards the end of the year. If you celebrate a holiday this month, have a great one. If you don't celebrate a holiday, I hope you get at least some time off from work and get to sleep a little bit. I know it's gonna be a bit of a struggle because probably many of us are not seeing the relatives that we would really love to be seeing. So I hope that you have a, a lovely time with your family. Stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, get your booster when you can. Um, it's great to see you. We will send an update on when the next OOB will be, hopefully January. And in the meantime, Chris, will you take us out with your beautiful illustration? Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Chris, this is great. Thanks. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah, I was just thinking that's not a joke, possibly, Chris's comment. What I hear from people who are just coming back to work uh, when they're still a bit sick with COVID is that they can't concentrate for more than about half an hour and then the concentration capacity goes. So I'm just wondering, Chris, whether your um, capacity has just got a bit limited. Uh, especially as you were doing your picks anyway that was just a thought well this is my first one so it's been yeah. okay so i must be on the mend but okay. i'm definitely going to take the rest of a week off okay <laughs> thank you for blessing us with your participation i just saw that john had come off his his cell phone um uh, and was connected by his computer i always like to give john a moment in these sessions so just begging your indulgence. Here's John Atkinson. Very quickly then, David, thank you for calling on me. 
Um, and it's to reinforce something that you've, that you've been saying. Um, you and I have spoken often on these sessions about living systems. And one of the characteristics of a living system is integrity, which in some instances is thought to mean a sort of honest thing. We must do what we say. We, we should be our message. But it also means wholeness, the integrity of a building, how it all holds together. And unless we look at the pandemic with integrity, looking at the whole of it, it's going to keep coming around at us. And that's why it's so important that we think deeply and carefully about what happens beyond the boundaries of our immediate interest, beyond the boundaries of our nation and take a global response. And so the more we can bring others into this conversation, the better. So integrity, David. Thank you, John. And I noticed that in your writings about living systems leadership, you've included integrity more and more as a property that you consider absolutely vital. If we want to bring people together, we ourselves have to demonstrate sufficient integrity so that those who travel with us actually can see it as well and can understand it. Thank you for everything you've said on that. If you want a last word, please say it now. So everybody, have a good break if you're gonna have a break and all Catherine's points are, are really accentuated by us. We will connect with you in January. The actual timing will be made clear, but keep a look, keep looking uh, at the inbox. We'll send a message at the beginning of the first week of January to let you know. Thanks again. Thanks for the picture. I'm now going to move towards closing down. So bye bye all and uh, thanks again for being with us. <laughs>